Father, we come before you and boldly and with great joy confess that it is only through Jesus that we can be made right with you, that we can come into your presence, a presence in whom there is fullness of joy forevermore. And we come to give you thanks that you have done everything that is necessary to reconcile us to yourself through the work of your Son. We want to be the kind of followers of Jesus whose lives bear witness to the work that Jesus has done in our place. We want to be the kind of people who live transformed lives, different from who we once were, different from those around us, so that the world will see and know that we are your children, that we have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, that we who were once your enemies have now been reconciled and made your sons and daughters through the work of your only begotten Son, Jesus. And so we ask this morning as we come to open up the Scriptures, to spend time thinking about, meditating upon your Word, that your Holy Spirit would do a work in us to give us insight and understanding, but also to be changed, to be made more like Jesus because of what we see in your word and what we come to understand in your word. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can take a seat for a moment. And I want to invite you this morning to open up in your own copy of the scriptures to the Gospel of Matthew. Gospel of Matthew. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 5 this morning. If you're using one of the Bibles that we've sort of laid out in the chairs and spread out, then you just have to turn to page 810. You don't even have to find Matthew chapter 5. Just turn to page 810 and then you'll be in Matthew chapter 5. This morning we're actually finishing a three-part, three-week little series that we've been in talking about what it means to be both online and on mission. We've acknowledged that as Christians, we have a mission that Jesus himself gave to us. He said in the Great Commission that we were to go and make disciples of all the nations. That is for all of us. If you are a follower of Jesus, then you are, in a very real sense, a missionary. You are on mission in your family, at your workplace, at school, in the grocery store, when you sit down to eat at a restaurant, when you go into a coffee shop. You are at all times, as a believer and a follower of Jesus, you are on mission. But we've also acknowledged that we live a significant part of our lives now online. We probably, many of us probably interact with more people online in a meaningful type of way than we do in our regular lives. We are more apt to carry on a conversation with a stranger online, whether it be on social media or whether it be in some sort of uh, chat group or in the comments on a blog post. We are more apt to have a conversation with a stranger on the internet than we are with a stranger at the grocery store or in a restaurant. It's just the way that we live our lives. We've become very comfortable living a significant portion of our lives online. And if that's true, then that means that when we are online, if we are followers of Jesus, we are also there on mission. And so what we've been talking about in this series is how to effectively be engaged in the mission that Jesus has given to us to make disciples when we are online, when we're on the internet, whether we're on social media or what have you. How can we be effective in the mission that Christ has given to us? And for the last two weeks... We've sort of approached it from a negative standpoint. In other words, for the last two weeks, I've warned you about things that could derail you. Things that could limit or eliminate 
your effectiveness in the mission that Jesus has given to us as you engage with people online. One of those, the first week we looked at, was that of dissensions, the danger of dissensions and disagreements and divisions within the church as they put themselves on display in the ways in which we comment and we discuss and interact with one another on the church. That will ruin our ability to effectively share the gospel with people in the online world. Nobody wants to be a part of a people group that is divided and fighting and backfighting with one another. And so Paul gives us great instructions in the form of of the fruit of the Spirit in how to live with one another, how to interact with one another, and how to engage with the world in a way that shows our unity rather than any sort of division that we might bring into the body of Christ. And then last week, we looked at the dangers of what the Bible calls sexual immorality. Now, even using that phrase, I sort of sound sort of old-fashioned, and I'm aware of that, but it's a good Bible word to describe anything that we do from a sexual standpoint in mind or deed outside of the context of the marriage of a man and a woman. The Bible would call that sexual immorality. And it, it itself presents a great danger for us because that will, our involvement in that will kill our impulse to share the gospel with others. It will make us feel unworthy. It will make us feel as if we should be silent. How can we call others to repentance when we're living a sinful lifestyle? And so the ways in which you interact online, the things that you look at online, the things that you watch, the things that you listen to, can have a great impact on your effectiveness in the mission that Jesus has given to us. And so we've seen some things that we want to avoid so that we can be effective in the mission. And that's good. We need to be warned about those things. We need to know those things. But the reality is is that we also need to know, so, so we know what not to do, but what can we do positively to be better at being missionaries for Jesus wherever we are and when we're on the internet? What can we do to be better at that? And this morning, I want to suggest to you that one of the answers... One of the primary answers that the Bible gives to us is that we should be a people living in such a way that the world looks at us and sees and knows that we are different. In other words, we should be a people who are producing and doing good works in the world. And so I want to read a passage this morning from Matthew chapter 5. Now this is called, Matthew chapters 5 through 7 is called the Sermon on the Mount. Because it's a sermon that Jesus preached on a mountainside. That's not complicated, all right? Jesus preached this sermon, but he delivered it to his followers, to his disciples. He didn't deliver it to the crowds and to the masses that, were, that would sometimes follow him and gather around him. In fact, he, he went aside. He took them aside and he preached this sermon to them to help them to see the kind of lives that he expected his followers to live. And so we're going to jump in at verse 13 and just read down through verse 16. So I want to ask you if you would stand to your feet in honor of God's word as we read this morning. Jesus says, You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You guys can take a seat. There's a a letter that was discovered some time ago. We only have one copy of it, one ancient copy of it that was discovered. It's known as the Letter to Diognetus, and it was written sometime in the 100s A.D. So just figure somewhere between 100 and 150 years after the ministry and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Just fast forward about a century or a century and a half, Christianity by that time had spread to many places throughout the Roman Empire. Jesus' disciples, his earliest disciples, did what he told them to do. 
they went out and they made more disciples. And the Apostle Paul had traveled to cities all over the Roman Empire and he'd started churches all over the place. They weren't in the majority by this time. In fact, they're a very small minority still. But they're fairly well spread out throughout the Roman Empire. And others began to be curious about them. In fact, the Roman rulers wanted to know, how, what are we supposed to do with these Christians? How do we treat them? How do we respond to them? Because in some ways, they are very clearly different from everyone else. But then in other ways, they look just like everyone else. In fact... They're not a distinct sort of ethnic group. They're not. They started that way as as Jewish converts to Christianity. But by the time that we're reading the letter that we're going to read from in a moment, they're, they're from every different ethnicity. So they're not an ethnic group that you can point to by the way that they look or by their cultural conventions, the way that they dress. No, they look like everyone else. They're mingled in with the rest of the society, but they live differently than everyone else. And so... Roman rulers wanted to know what to do about these Christians. And so here's a letter that was written by a Christian. We don't know who. It's it's anonymous. We don't know who this individual was. But they wrote this letter to a Roman governor to give them some insight into what Christians were like and how other people perceived Christians. And I'm just going to read a few excerpts from this letter. He says this. He says, The Christians are distinguished from other men neither by country, nor language, nor the customs which they observe. Inhabiting the Greek as well as barbarian cities, according as the lot of each of them has determined in following the customs of the natives in respect to clothing, food, and the rest of their ordinary conduct. They display to us their wonderful and striking method of life. In other words, what this writer is saying is that Christians look like everybody else, they dress like everybody else, they come from all these different cities, they're they're not made up of one particular group, but their way of life is striking and in some sense wonderful. Then he goes on, he says, "They, they dwell in their own countries, but simply as sojourners. As citizens, they share in all things with others and yet endure all things as if foreigners. Every foreign land is to them as their native country, and every land of their birth as a land of strangers. They marry, as do all others. They have children, but they do not destroy their offspring. In other words, they don't participate in the practice of abortion, and they don't do what was common in that world. If you had an unwanted child, people would just leave them out in the woods. Just leave them in the wilderness. And this writer says they don't do that. They're not like everyone else around us. They have a common table, but not a common bed, so they, they don't participate in all the sexual promiscuity that we see everywhere else. He says, they are in the flesh, but they do not live after the flesh. They pass their days on earth, but they are citizens of heaven. They obey the prescribed laws, and at the same time, surpass the laws by their lives. They love all men, and are persecuted by all. They are unknown and condemned, They are put to death and restored to life. They are poor, yet make many rich. They are in lack of all things, and yet abound in all. They are dishonored, and yet in their very dishonor they are glorified. They are spoken of with evil, and yet are justified. They are reviled, and they bless. They are insulted, and they repay insult with honor. They do good, yet are punished as evildoers. When punished, they rejoice. As if brought into life. They are assailed by the Jews as foreigners and are persecuted by the Greeks. Yet those who hate them are unable to assign any reason for their hatred. To sum it all up in one word. What the soul is to the body. That are Christians in the world. They're just different. And even when they suffer... Those who persecute them can't give a good reason. In other words, they can't point out the evil, wicked, terrible things that they've done because they live exemplary lives. They obey the laws. They even surpass what the law requires. They live such good lives. They are different even though they look like the rest of us. They are known by the kind of lives that they live. 
sounds a lot like what we're reading here in Matthew chapter 5. In fact, I, I kind of sort of almost could hear some of Jesus' words that come right before the passage that we read when this writer was talking about how early Christians suffered and yet they blessed others. When they were persecuted, they loved those who persecuted them. Listen to these words, just a couple of verses before the verses we read a moment ago. Verse 11 in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says to his disciples, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. They're doing what Jesus called them to do, these early Christians. Are they persecuted? Yes. Does being a Christian exempt you from suffering in the world? No, not according to Jesus and not according to the experience of the earliest Christians. It doesn't exempt you from suffering in the world. But as a follower of Jesus, we should respond differently. And these early Christians responded differently to their persecution than other groups did. And they were noticed for it. People outside of Christianity who viewed Christianity as some sort of new, weird cult took notice that those involved in that new, weird cult were just different somehow. Now, you might think to yourself, well, yeah, but you said that letter that you read a second ago was written by a Christian to a Roman governor. So they probably would want to paint themselves in a positive light, right? They probably would want to say good things about other Christians. So how do we know that that's accurate? How do we know that that's a good, accurate portrait of what early Christians were really like? Well, we have other writings. In fact, if you fast forward 100 to 150 years, we have one writing that comes from a Roman emperor named Julian. Now, Julian had no love for Christians. He saw Christians as upsetting, in some ways, the moral order of the day. He saw them as in the way. And yet, he could not deny that they were admired by their neighbors, admired by their Greek and Roman neighbors because of their lifestyles. And that was one of the things that he could not, he could persecute them, but he could not end the influence that they had upon others by the way that they lived. Just by the way that they lived, other people were seeing and coming to them and then hearing the good news and becoming followers. They were multiplying because they were getting people's attention by the lives that they lived. And he wanted to find a solution to this. It wouldn't do to just put the Christians to death because the more you persecuted them, the faster they grew because the godlier they were in the middle of their persecution. That wasn't working as a strategy. It hadn't for any other emperor. It wouldn't work for him. So he devised another strategy and he wrote a letter to a man named Arsacius. Now that's a weird name, but he was, he was the high priest of the pagan gods in a region of the Roman Empire called Galatia. The same place that Paul wrote his letter to the Galatians to. This, this high priest, Julian addresses, and he tells him what his strategy is for combating the, the godly lives of the Christians. He, he says this to him. He says, Why do we, so this is Julian the emperor, why do we not observe that it is their benevolence, that's their kindness, it's their benevolence to strangers, their care for the graves of the dead and the pretended holiness of their lives that have done the most to increase atheism. Now, you might say atheism. Well, that's, it's a funny way that the Romans treated Christians. They, they, call, they would often call Christians atheists because Christians didn't believe in all the Roman gods. They only believed in one god. And so they were often referred to as atheists. And he says here, the thing that's spreading this atheism the fastest is the lives that they live. And then he says this, here's the strategy. I believe that we ought really and truly to practice every one of these virtues. And it's not enough for you alone to practice them. But so must all the priests in Galatia without exception. Either shame them, that's the other priests, or persuade them into righteousness. So this Roman emperor who can't stand Christians 
cannot deny the lifestyle of the Christians and the effect that it's having on everyone else, but he does recognize that even the priests of his own religion do not match the common Christian in morality. And so he says, you're going to have to change the way you live and you have to make all the other priests. You can either persuade them or you can shame them into it, but you're going to have to get them to live these righteous lives like the Christians do. This is, this is the way that Christians lived in the early centuries of the church. Now, that doesn't mean that they were perfect. We can just read the New Testament and see that Christians were not perfect. Even while the apostles were alive, they had to make a lot of corrections. They had to instruct them a lot of times in morality because they were coming out of that Greco-Roman pagan mindset and lifestyle. It took some time. They had to be instructed. They stumbled. They, they fell at times. But on the whole, there was something in the early church that made Christians stand out, and it was the lives that they lived. They did what Jesus says. He says, let your light shine before others so that they, the watching world, the others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. We should live our lives in such a way that other people look and see our good works. And the only thing that they can say is it must be because they're Christians. There should be something different about us. But it's always confusing when you start to talk about good works, I think. There are at least two primary ways, I think, in which we can become confused about this call in the Bible to do good works. Because over and over in the Bible, we're given all sorts of commands about how we should live our lives. We're told over and over to do good works. And so oftentimes we get confused about what role good works have to play in making us a Christian in the first place. Is it, is it by doing good words, works and living like Jesus, imitating the lifestyle of Jesus, is that the way that we become Christians? Is that what makes a person a Christian? And the answer to that question is no. That's not what makes a person a Christian. That's what comes out of the life and heart of a person who is a Christian. Now I need to show you that from the Bible. So I want you to hold your place in Matthew chapter 5. And I want you to turn all the way in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. We're still in the New Testament. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 2. That's going to be page 976 if you're using one of our Bibles. Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul is going to mention in one paragraph, good works two times. And we need to pay attention to the different ways in which he mentions good works. So we'll jump in sort of at the middle. We'll jump in at verse 8. And we'll just read and see what Paul says. Paul says... For by grace, now he's talking to Christians, of course. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So did, did you see the first instance of works there? Paul says, you're saved. You've been rescued from the penalty of your sin. That's what it means to be saved. Right? Paul said earlier in Ephesians chapter 2 that before you were saved, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. You were following the prince of this world. We used to belong to someone else. If you have not put your faith in Jesus, you belong to someone else whether you know it or not. And you are in need of salvation. You need to be rescued from your sin. Paul says in Romans that all of us have sinned and fallen short of giving God the glory that He deserves. All of us. All of us are sinners. And he tells us that God is a righteous God, and so God doesn't ignore sin because He's righteous and holy and He's a good judge. He will one day judge us for our sin. And that's bad news because we're all sinners. And we're all going to face God's judgment. Unless... Someone else takes his judgment for us. Unless someone else takes the penalty that you deserve for your sin, 
you're going to have to endure that penalty someday. But Jesus came into the world so that in his death, he could take the judgment that you and I deserve. And Paul says, it is by grace that you have been saved. It was God's grace, a free gift that sent Jesus into the world. It was by grace that Jesus willingly went to the cross. It was by grace that his Father poured out upon him the wrath that we deserve. It was by grace that Jesus willingly said, if this cup, the cup of the wrath of my Father, if it cannot pass, God let your will be done. It was Jesus, by grace, who hung on the cross, did everything necessary to rescue us from our sins, and then declared, it's finished. The debt is paid in full. It's over. He's done the work of redemption. All of that's by grace. So Paul just sums it up by saying, by grace you have been saved. And that came, he says, through faith. In other words, our part in salvation is that we trust in Jesus. Which means you don't really have a part, right? You just trust that Jesus has done everything to redeem you, to pay the price for your sins. That's all you do. You acknowledge your sins. You say, I don't want to be that person anymore. And I trust that Jesus has paid the penalty for my sins. Through faith. And then he goes on to say, and that is not even your own doing. That itself is the gift of God. And then we come to the phrase in verse 9, not a result of works so that no one may boast. Works, good works, doing good things, do not play a role in whether or not you are saved. You doing good things does nothing to secure heaven for you. Because you can never do enough good things to outweigh a single sin against a perfect, holy, righteous God. The scales will never be balanced in your favor. And that's okay. Because God has not told us to do good works to get into heaven. He has told us, trust in the work of my Son on the cross. And heaven is yours for free because he paid for it, not you. Good works have nothing to do with whether or not you are a Christian. They have nothing to do with whether or not you will someday enter into heaven. It's all about Jesus and what he has done for us. But that doesn't mean that good works have nothing to do with living a Christian life. Because if you go on and read the next verse in Ephesians 2, you see that there's still a role within our lives for good works to play. Verse 10, for we are His workmanship. He did all the work, right? Created in Christ Jesus. That means made new, rescued, saved, redeemed, reconciled. All that's wrapped up in that, word, that phrase, created in Christ Jesus. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before him, beforehand that we should walk in them. So your good works do nothing to secure your salvation. They don't rescue you from your sin. But once you have been rescued by Jesus, once you've been made one of his followers and a son of his father, once that has happened to you, then there are good works that God has ready for you to perform. In other words, good works are not what produces your salvation. Good works are produced by your salvation. That's why Paul calls those fruit of the Spirit in Galatians fruit. They're not fertilizer. You don't pour them on the ground of your heart and hope that you can somehow produce a crop. No. You put your faith in Jesus. He puts His Spirit within you. And then He begins to grow fruit. And God has prepared for Christians good works 
that He expects us to do, not so that we can earn our salvation, but so that we can live like people who have been given salvation for free, only at the cost of another. Good works have a role to play in our lives, but not a saving role. They show and demonstrate and give evidence that we belong to Jesus. And I don't want you to be confused about that. If, if you get nothing else out of this morning's sermon, if you don't follow anything else, I don't want you to be confused about that one thing. You cannot be saved. Your sins cannot be forgiven by your good works, but they can by the work of Jesus and through your faith in Him. And then He will begin to work in you in a way that you begin to do good works. Good works are the evidence. They are the sign of a heart that has been changed and transformed by God Himself through faith in Jesus. So now we come back to Matthew chapter 5 to think about these good works. Good works that we've already seen were on display in the lives of early Christians that made them stand out, that made them different from the world around them. Now let's pay closer attention to what Jesus has to say specifically about these good works. Back to verse 16 again. Jesus says, In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works. So when we ask the question, what's the light that shines out in this passage? The light is your good works. The good things you do as a follower of Jesus are like a light that shines out into the world. Now go up to verse 14. That's made really clear. Jesus says, you are, and the emphasis there in the original language is on the word you. Like, you, you followers of Jesus, separate from everybody else. You, and only you. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. Jesus does not say here, you can be a light, or you should be a light, or do everything that you can to shine a little bit brighter in the world. That's not what Jesus says to his disciples. Because they are his disciples, they already are the light of the world. If you are a follower of Jesus, you are the light of the world. Here's the implication of that. You live in a dark world. The world is dark. The world is in darkness. That's just the same thing as saying that the world is a sinful, fallen place. But it's not a sinful, fallen place because there is some entity out there called sin that's making it sinful. No, it's a sinful fallen place because people are sinful and fallen. Just watch the news or read the news on your phone and you'll see very quickly bad story after bad story. All sorts of terrible things happening in every nation on the face of the earth, in every city of every nation of the earth. Bad things are happening. Bad things are happening right now. All around us. Because it's a dark world. Because it's a messed up place. We live in a dark world. Jesus says, if you are one of my followers, in the midst of that dark world, you are a light. You're the light of the world. It's significant that he says world there. It means that there's not another source of light, but for the whole world, for all the world. The light that's available are Christians. Now it can be confusing because in the passage that we read earlier, we're told that the gospel is light, right? Or we're told by Jesus in John chapter 8, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. So how are Christians the unique only source of light in a dark world if... The gospel, the good news about Jesus, is also called light. And if Jesus himself is called light, how, how can it be true? 
that we are alone the source of light for the world. It's true in a couple of ways. Number one, Jesus is no longer physically present upon the earth. The presence of Jesus is only made known through the followers of Jesus. You want other people to know what Jesus is like, you have to show them by being like him. There's not another way. Jesus is, in a very real sense, the light of the world. But now he shines through us, and therefore we have become light. Jesus is the sun, and at night you don't see the sun, do you? It's gone. You see the moon. But has it ever occurred to you that the moon is incapable of producing light? It's literally a giant rock. Rocks and dust, that's all there is on the moon, is dead. No life, no light. The moon can't produce light. The moon reflects the light of the sun into the dark night. That's what Christians do. We reflect the light of Christ into a dark world in such a way that we become the light of the world. So what about the gospel, though? The gospel is the light, right? And as we proclaim the gospel, wait, there it is, right? How does the gospel go out into the world? Through us. Charles Spurgeon said it this way. He said, the gospel is God's light for Christians. And Christians are those who shine that light into the world. Just as the world cannot on its own see what Jesus is like, they cannot come to hear or respond to the light of the gospel unless we shine that light into the world. We are the means by which we are God's plan for shining light into a dark world. If you're a follower of Jesus, that's your job. That's your vocation. You're a light to shine into the world. The reality is that the moral vision that we proclaim to a watching world by the way that we live, that moral vision has greater persuasive power than anything else that we might offer. The moral vision, the difference that Christians have within their hearts and within their lives is more persuasive than any ad campaign, than anything creative that we might come up with to grab the attention of the world. The thing that will make us stand out, the thing that will be more persuasive as we then go on to share the gospel with people, is a different kind of life, a different moral vision, one that stands out in the midst of a dark world. When you interact with people in, in person or online, you will project something. You will put on display something for them. You will either shine the light of the Christian moral vision. Remember from that letter we read earlier? The Christians, they don't, they don't kill their children. They don't do that. The Christians, they, they obey the laws so well that they go beyond what the law requires. Well, the Christians are so different that they, they're out there taking care of the sick people that the world has abandoned. They're out there cleaning up the tombstones of people they don't know. They're out there doing good things. And that morality grab the attention of a watching world to the extent that a lost, pagan, evil Roman emperor, known for his wickedness, would look and say, we're going to have to do some of the stuff that these Christians are doing. We're going to have to imitate some of the righteousness that they're doing if we want to win some of our people back to our own religions. There is power, there is persuasive power in the morality of the Christian faith. 
when it's actually put on display and not just talked about. In your interactions with people, you can positively put on display through your words and your actions a different moral vision from the world than what we're seeing all around us. Now let me connect this back to something that I talked about two weeks ago. Two weeks ago when I talked about the way that we interact with one another online, I talked about the fact that we, we need to avoid divisions, controversies, arguing with one another online. And all that's true. We need to avoid that stuff. But there is a place for the setting forth or the proclaiming or the putting on display. Pick your language. There is a place for the presentation of the Christian morality. We can explain and defend what we believe and how we live as Christians, we can do that in a way that's not rude or mean or caustic. Because when you're rude and mean and caustic in the ways in which you put those things on display, you're doing things <laughs> that are the opposite of the kind of moral vision you're trying to present to the world. Do you want to argue for a pro-life position online? You want to, pre you want to present... The evidence for why that's the right approach to take. You can't be mean about it. You can't call people names. You can't get angry with people. You patiently give them the truth and let your life become powerfully pers persuasive before them. That's what you do. It's not that we are locked in to never interacting with anyone online in, in ways other than posting Bible verses. No. We have something powerful. We have the gospel. And we have a way of life that accompanies that gospel. A moral vision for living that adorns and decorates the gospel. That we can present before a watching world. It is ridiculous, according to Jesus. It's absurd to think that a lit up city sitting on a hill would not be able to be seen by anyone around. Now, that might, we might have a little bit of a disconnect from that imagery living in the modern world where we're always surrounded by lights, right? But if, if you go truly way out in the wilderness, no light, and if there's no moon, and the stars are not out because of the clouds, you can put your hand here and not see it. Real, true, like dark. But if there's a city elevated up, even a hundred miles away, you'll be able to see. Not with crystal clarity, of course, but you'll be able to see around you. In the ancient world, there were no artificial sources of light other than fire. Right? Right? There's no street lamps, there's no flashlights. When you're wandering down a road, you find a place to bunker down for the night because it's dark and you can't see where you're going. But if there's a city off in the distance, you can see. To think that a Christian could live their lives in such a way that their good works would not be noticed is as ridiculous as thinking that a city set on a hill would not be seen from a distance. Or he goes on and he says, nobody lights a lamp, takes it, hides it under a basket. They put it on a lampstand and it gives light to everybody in the house. Lights up the whole house. It, again, he's trying to say to you, it's ridiculous to think that if you're one of my followers, you won't shine as a light in the world. It's not possible. It makes no sense. Nobody does that. Nobody lights a lamp, covers it up, and keeps the room dark. The whole point of the lamp is to light the room. And it always does its job. We are to be the light of the world. We can present before the world a compelling, persuasive, moral vision so that others want to hear 
What is this good news you keep talking about that made you into the kind of person that you are? But there's more. There's one more thing we need to see, and I'll say, show you this quickly. Verse 13, he uses a totally different metaphor from light. There he says, you are the salt of the earth. It's different, right? Well, in the ancient world, salt was used to preserve food, especially meats. There was no refrigeration back then, right? There's no, you don't have a freezer to throw something in. If you slaughter an animal, that's a lot of meat. You need it to last for a while. What are you going to do? You don't have a refrigerator or a freezer. It's covered in salt, and it'll last for a really long time. Salt was primarily used as a preservative in the ancient world. And so Jesus is saying to us here that not only do we shine out a compelling moral vision to draw others in, but we have a kind of preserving influence, or we ought to at least have a kind of preserving influence in the world. That is, we live in a world that is full of decay and rot. Full of it. All around us. And the mere presence of Christians should slow the progress of that rot. That's the power of the Christian moral vision in the world. That it slows the rot and it dispels the darkness. That's what it does. That's what we're supposed to do as we live authentically Christian lives in the world. And again, Jesus goes on to say something ridiculous, absurd. He says, if the salt loses its taste, how do you make it salty again? How shall its saltiness be restored? But it's not good for anything anymore. Now, technically speaking, salt cannot lose its flavor. Like, it can't. That's the kind of element that, I mean, that's the kind of mineral that it is. It doesn't actually ever lose flavor. And and that's sort of Jesus' point here is, If it were somehow to lose its flavor, how do you make salt salty if salt doesn't have flavor? You can't. You can't. There's not another source to which the world or the church can turn. It is only the real, true followers of Jesus acting as salt and light in the world that can make a difference in the world. And the preservative function of the Christian moral vision is such that it often outlasts those who live that life. We're seeing that. We're seeing it right now. As there are fewer and fewer genuine, authentic followers of Jesus in the Western world. So I mean like Europe, North America. As there are fewer and fewer Christians. And there are. All all the statistics tell us that there are fewer and fewer Christians. I mean, we can know that just by looking at church attendance numbers following up COVID. They've dipped drastically. The vast majority of people have resumed their lives in every way. But what about people who were just church attenders and not followers of Jesus? They're not here anymore. They're not filling up churches all over the country anymore. So we know, even looking at that, but tons of other statistics, we know that there are fewer genuine followers of Jesus in the world today, or in the Western world today, than there once were. And we do know that the moral decay is speeding up in a lot of ways. But it would have gone much more quickly had... Christians in the past not maintained a preserving influence in the world. Even still, in many ways, it's a Christian worldview, a Christian morality that holds back so many things. The few things that we still universally sort of across political divides still agree, oh yeah, that's wrong. There are a few left. Most of those things were not regarded as wrong in the world before Christianity. I'll give you one example. Pedophilia was common and normal 
and admired in the Roman world. It wasn't looked upon as shameful at all. It was just normal. Your neighbor did it over here, your neighbor did it. It was part of life. It was part of the social structure, even, until the rise of Christianity. Why is it still wrong in Western culture? If it wasn't wrong in Western culture then, why is it still wrong now? Because of the preservative influence of the Christian moral vision. It will fade unless we multiply, unless we are effectively engaged in the mission and we multiply by making more disciples. It will continue to fade and things that we once saw as shocking will become normal again. It's already happening. But do not underestimate the power of the life that Jesus lays out for his people. Do not underestimate the power of this moral vision for the whole world, but also for your coworker, for your family member, for your neighbor, for the person that you see on a regular basis in the coffee shop that you go to all the time. It is powerful. I said there were two ways in which we confuse good works. One is to think that they contribute to our salvation when they don't. The other is to think that the good works actually become the message that we proclaim. And they don't. The good works that we do are not the message. They are the means by which the message is made known to the world. The message is the gospel that I shared earlier, that Christ came to bear the penalty for sins for those who deserve God's wrath. That's the good news. And the good works that you perform don't replace that good news. You can't say, I'll preach the gospel and occasionally use words. The word gospel means good news. News needs words. But you can say, I will preach the gospel and I will gain an audience by my good works. Let's pray together. God, we are so thankful that you have not called us to earn our own salvation. And we are thankful that you have in Jesus done everything to rescue us from our sins. And I pray, Father, that if there's anybody here this morning or anybody listening online who hasn't yet put their faith in Jesus, they've not yet trusted in Him, that they would cry out to Him in faith now, save me from my sins. And God, I pray that You would Continue the work of transforming your people into what we were made to be, salt and light, in a world that desperately needs salt and light. So that we might go out with power Form the mission that you've given to us. I pray these things in Jesus' name.